Hey, welcome to Golden Black Live, March 1st. Hard to believe we flipped the calendar, <laughs> isn't it, Kyle? My guest, my guest today, Kyle Charters, the great Kyle Charters. Of course, he has a morning radio show on the Hammer 101.7 on your FM dial. And, of course, as usual, Golden Black Live is brought to you by Hilton Garden Inn. You know, when tomorrow's a big day, stay at GHI tonight. I know Kyle does. And State Farm Agent Trent Johnson. Triple X Family Restaurant's always on the hill. Been there a time or two. I was, I was there yesterday for my Blaine <laughs> Purpose All-American. And Basham Rentals, the best in student housing. It's already taken reservations for 2019-20. That's a great segue then, because Kyle and I are going to already try to make predictions and observations <laughs> on 2019 for Purdue football. Kyle was at practice Wednesday. Of course, the Boilers took the lid off spring football on Monday, the first of 15 sessions, and they were just in helmets and shorts. You can't always tell a lot, Kyle, but um, initially I just would like to know what your concerns are, maybe number one on offense, and number two, what your biggest concern is on defense. Well, they're pretty easy, Tom. It's, it's on the lines, offensive and defensive lines. I, mean, I think clearly at Purdue that's going to be a, an issue. It always has been and feels like it always will be, uh, just uh, varying levels, I guess, of issue, especially for me on the offensive line. I think that's where Purdue has some real questions, especially on the interior. And, you know, we see the first two practices with, you know, a guy like Alex Criddle, who hasn't played a whole lot as a defensive tackle through his first few years as a Boilermaker, and then gets shuffled over to, to offensive line during bowl practices. And then on day one of spring practice, he's a starting left guard. Yeah. And, you know, that's not to be uh, an offense to Alex Criddle, but more of an illustration of sort of where Purdue is, that, you know, you'd move a guy and, and pop him in. Now, he wasn't the number one then on Wednesday. I think that was Jimmy McKenna, but that's another story in itself, yep. right, that yep. it's a redshirt freshman that you're popping in there <clears throat> at one of the guard spots. So that's, that's the biggest issue on the whole team, I think, is the interior of the offensive line, especially when you look at what Purdue wants to be able to do, and that's – you know, use Eliza Sindelar to chuck the ball as far as he can down the field. You've got to be able to hold up at the line of scrimmage. And then, you know, without Lorenzo Neal out there on the defensive line, and, you know, we're going on almost 10 years since Purdue had a relevant, relevant defensive end, like a Ryan Kerrigan yeah, defensive end. Now, <laughs> Ryan Kerrigan's an All-American and a, you know, NFL All-Pro, I understand that, but he was sort of the last of the – the great defensive ends. The Dano come. defensive yeah, ends, I mean, the last for two. That was 2010. I know. So we're going on almost a decade. And, I, you know, is, is somebody out there, is it George Karloftis? Is that too much pressure to put on the youngster? I don't know. I mean, he looks good. He looks good even without pads on. So, you know, that's the areas that I was spending my most time watching, Monday and Wednesday. Yeah, George looked good. We're in number five, the West Lafayette Red Devil, enrolled early at Purdue to get a jump start. Nick Holt addressed the media after practice on Wednesday, and he had a lot of nice things to say about George. You know, he, he's trying hard, giving good effort. As you said, Kyle, he looks the part. He does. And I think football matters to George. He has a fire in his belly. Um, maybe he is the elixir to produce pass rush woes. Maybe it's someone who's not here yet, Dante Hunter. Mm -hmm. Fans, keep that name on your radar. He's a freshman from Columbus, Ohio, who will arrive in June. So, yeah, like Kyle said, that pass rush is uh, DEFCON 1 for the Purdue <laughs> defense to reference 1983 war games. And offensively, he's talked about Kyle, the two guards in the center. Victor Beach, the center spot. Kirk Barron was an anchor for three yeah. years. That's huge. And, again, Victor Beach looks like the probably heir apparent there. So those are some big-time spots on that, on that program that we're watching as spring develops. One last quick note, today – they go in shells, which are helmets and shoulder pads. So mm -hmm. maybe they'll be a little bit more physical. And, and, Kyle, you worked for Golden Black for a number of years. You saw a lot of Purdue football. You were here when Jeff Brom got hired. Mm -hmm. You've seen this two-year transformation, which has been at hyper speed. I'd like your perspective on how the players you see on campus now compared to the players you saw back in 2017. And I Should I name know. names? Should I pull out names of guys? Yeah, but again, <laughs> nobody could even envision Purdue going 13 and 13 with two bowls in Jeff Brom's first two years. Well, look, the days of looking out there and seeing a 5'8", 165-pound 
recruited safety as a freshman are over. I mean, that, that to me is, you look at that, just using that position as sort of a barometer yeah. of where <clears throat> Jeff Brom is in the Purdue program now compared to a few years ago. And you look out there, and they've got um, they've got Jalen Graham. Six foot three, Corey Trice. Corey Trice six is the name I was three. looking for there. Corey Trice, he's, I mean, he's all of 6'3", 200-plus yeah. pounds. I call him Spider-Man. Jalen Graham is what, 6'1", six, six, 200, whatever he's, he's listed at? They listed him at 6'3", six, six, Jalen Graham, yeah. He's a big kid, too. I mean, you just look out there and look at those guys, and you're like, okay, this is, is a different Purdue team with these guys out there rather than what we saw only a handful of years ago when Purdue was much smaller, and it wasn't always a trade-off, the size for the speed. Uh, I think in the Big Ten West, you've got to be able to, to match up with some teams to be able to win day in and day out. I think Purdue could continue to do what it has done in the first two years. If it stayed the same size that it was, you know, it could go 500. It could win some games. Maybe it would sneak up and beat an Ohio State occasionally. But then the next week it would go to Michigan State and just look like it was completely outclassed from a physicality point of view. But what Brom's been able to do is bring in some guys who look more Big Ten ready than what we have seen over certainly the last five or six years. Maybe you could go back even even a full decade with that. And I you know that's been the impressive thing to me. Yeah, the quality of athlete they've been able to lure to West Lafayette in a short period of time has been remarkable. Um, of course, they've had a lot to sell on the field. Uh, they've certainly augmented their cause. They've augmented their, their sales pitch with actual tangible on-field results. You could this is no joke. You could go out there to a practice and pick out 10 guys who were never going to play. No chance. And just say, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Scholarship never, players. Scholarship players. Yeah. Never going to play in the Big Ten. There's no chance. And you couldn't go out there and name 10 right now. They have shuffled some of those guys out of the program now. And some of them just you know, naturally have graduated Christian, out of yeah. the program now. But, you know, Purdue is, is a much uh, more talented team. Now, I'm not saying they're going out and win the Rose Bowl this year. The, the questions that we outlined, I think, are significant. Uh, those along the offense, offensive line in particular and defensive line, too, that, that, are, that are major parts of a winning football program that you know, I, I don't know that you saw this year again. I, I still think you're going to have to sort of bandage it together. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that Purdue will work on down the line to, to shore up so it's, you know, not as big a roller coaster, I think, on, on the offensive and defensive lines is what we've seen. Yeah, Dale Williams, the offensive line coach, has plenty of bodies to sort through up front. Like Kyle said, you talk to any football coach, and they'll tell you if you're not good up front, it doesn't matter if you have four David Bells, a wide receiver or Herschel Walker to hand the ball to. You've got to be good up front, and, and that remains a work in progress to yeah. a degree. Uh, the tackles, of course, we haven't talked about them. Grant Hermans, Matt McCann, both are back, so that gives the offensive line at least a little bit of a foundation, although each has had a history with injury. Uh, another, another issue, Kyle, I wrote about a couple of days ago. This is maybe a little more um, off the radar, but backup quarterback. Mm -hmm. Elijah Sindlar, we know, is the unquestioned starter. Um, but I talk, talked about injury. Um, he has an injury history. We all know yeah. about the knee issue. He had an oblique issue last year as well. Only played two games. What if Elijah Sindelar gets hurt? Now what? I don't know if you got a chance to look at Jake Plummer, the redshirt freshman, the redshirt sophomore, Nick Seip. Seem to be the two main contenders. But I also like sophomore walk-on Aiden O'Connell too. O'Connell's, a, you know, we shouldn't spend too much time on him because he's not going to win the job. Before a walk-on quarterback, he's actually pretty good. Yep, he is. He, I mean, he's a guy that you could put out there probably and not have fear about him throwing the ball, which in, a, in the case of a lot of walk-ons, you don't want him out there throwing it. He's just out there snapping the ball, handing it off. Uh, will it be Jack Plummer or Nick Sype? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, to me, there's not a huge separation. I think Plummer yeah. maybe has a little bit better arm. And I, I, I they, they, you know, that's a player that, that Brom recruited, too, so maybe there's a little bit of an edge there for him as, you know, Sype was a, a holdover. Though I think they like Sype too, and, and have, you know, after they've got a chance to see him a little bit, maybe he's a little bit better than what they, you know, anticipated when they came. But um, 
I don't know. I wouldn't be shocked if they list him as co-backups yeah. during the season because I, I just don't know that there's going to be a, a huge amount of separation. Neither one of them has much in the way of experience, Sipe a little bit. Uh, but I think you're going to hope that Sindelar stays healthy. I wouldn't be shocked if, if Purdue gets itself in a situation where it's got a lead in one of these early games. I think they will, whereas we have not seen it a whole lot in yeah. the first couple of years with a, you know, a, a change for the sake of getting the backup, uh, some experience, I think that certainly that will be a priority, I would imagine, for Jeff Brom in those early games if Purdue is able to go out. Tough. Yeah, if Purdue is able to go out and, and, and get a lead against uh, Nevada or whoever there in those first couple it's, of games. It's, for fans, it's at Nevada, then home, TCU Vanderbilt. Yeah. So it's yeah. like you're playing um, Kent State and Ball State and Illinois yeah. State. So um, ideally, Kyle, like you said, it'd be great to get those guys some legit live game action. Sipe just saw mop-up duty mm-hmm. against Minnesota and Illinois last year. Completed one pass for three yards. So, again, you, you never want to, you know, soft sell that backup quarterback situation when you're talking about Purdue this year with Sindelar and his, uh, his injury history. But, again, I tell you what, the skill talent Sindelar is going to be surrounded with. Um, the wide receiving core right now is pretty thin. Yeah. Uh, Rondell Moore missed Monday, was back out there Wednesday. But, Kyle, as you know, and as you know, Boiler Nation, you all are dying to see this crop of freshman <laughs> wide receivers, right? David Bell. T.J. Sheffield, Milton Wright, um, and Mershon Rice. I tell you yeah. what, it's a collection unlike Purdue's ever signed, and, and it's really going to be a lot of fun to see this staff integrate those wide receivers with a guy like Rondale Moore and even a veteran like Jared Sparks. It's clear what <laughs> Purdue wants to do, and Elijah Sindelar is the quarterback who can do it because yes. we're out of practice and we watch him chuck that ball down the field. And without much effort, it seems like he can drop back there and, and spin mm-hmm. it 50 yards down the field. Now – Right now, there's no way down there to catch it. <laughs> so, so that's going to be the key for Purdue is which one of those freshmen or multiple freshmen or Jared Sparks uh, steps up into a bigger role. You know, still with Sparks, and even we've seen it through the first two practices, doesn't get very good separation from, from those cornerbacks. And that is something that he, if he's going to hold on to that job, which he couldn't do last year, he's going to have to learn uh, whatever it is, you know, whether it's increasing his speed a little bit, whether it's some other trick that he can learn to get off those guys, something's going to have to click at some point with him or it's going to continue to be a struggle and he'll be overtaken by one of those freshmen. But uh, that's what Purdue wants to do, chuck it down the field. Uh, the two questions about doing that are not with the quarterback because I think he can sling it, but can somebody go get it and can the offensive line hold up long enough for them to, to get it down the field? And then uh, I think it's worth mentioning the linebacking core. That was a point of emphasis, obviously, Wednesday yeah. when the linebackers met with the media. Linebackers coach Nick Colt, Holt as well. Um, just a mash unit right now, Kyle. <laughs> you know, Marcus Bailey is not going to play this spring as he gets over a, a hip issue, had surgery. Cornell Jones will not see the field this spring, had foot surgery. Derek Barnes had thumb surgery, but that's okay but he subsequently tweaked a hamstring. That's kept him out the first two days, but he thinks he's going to be back very soon. So, But you do have, in my opinion, more numbers to throw at the situation better, this better year death, yep. than last year because, you know, all indications are that Marcus Bailey will be fine. Uh, you'll get Cornell Jones back, and, and hopefully he'll be a year more mature, which will help his play on the field, I would imagine. Uh, I, I think they like those two uh, Jay, younger Jay guys. Jalen Alexander yeah, and, and Jake and Smith. Smith yep. uh, uh, I said Jake Smith. Jack Smith. I, I think uh, they like those two guys. Uh, and then you bring in Ben Holt, who's an experienced, maybe a little bit undersized, but knows the mm. system and knows what he's doing out there. So, uh, And then Derek Barnes, whether he plays Leo or linebacker, that's, what, five or six guys, whereas last year – and you were talking about three guys, and then you were talking about two of those guys basically having no experience at all. So I, I think that Purdue's in better shape there yes. once everybody comes back. And uh, that's good for this defense because, you know, we know what Nick Holt wants to do is funnel the plays to those linebackers, and so those linebackers have to be able to make some plays. A couple wild cards, number 32, number 95, Elijah Ball, Jack Kravick are being cross-trained. Kravick's an end by trade, Ball's a safety Holt's training them as sort of hybrid linebackers, too. So 
they could be interesting dynamics. Yeah, in he, Quebec wearing number 95, I had to check my <laughs> roster there on the first day because I'm he like, looks good. yeah, he does. He He's gained good. a lot of weight. I mean, he'd take two, up to 245 on the roster. I don't, I, he had to come to Purdue. I, I don't know what they listed him at, but it feels like he had to come to Purdue about 210. Guy that you didn't notice at all, and all of a sudden you're like, whoa. This He's kid on, suddenly looks the part. He's on the Kyle Charter's workout plan, obviously. Yeah. And Kyle, of course, a lot? <laughs> Kyle, of course, <laughs> is the voice of Purdue baseball. And Purdue baseball, obviously, has really transformed itself. I'm clearly not there right. this weekend as they're playing here, like, right now. But, but, we, but, want, uh, but we got to know. Give us the skinny, <laughs> my friend. Talk about what you're doing, too, online. Give us a quick – give fans a quick rundown of maybe what they can expect from Purdue baseball and your coverage. Well, one in six <laughs> right now, they are – on the road this weekend for a chilly series in Tulsa to take on uh, Oral Roberts, a, a four-game series that's been moved to three and then been moved up twice to try and play two games today and one game tomorrow before the snow hits uh, later on on Saturday afternoon. Uh, but, you know, Purdue's been one and six, but they have played probably – uh, one of the ten most difficult schedules in the country through the first couple of weekends, and doing so with a young team. So they have uh, had some opportunities that they've let slip away, but I think that Mark Wazikowski is pretty pleased with just the idea that they have competed, especially in the last two games, last three games, they have you know appeared to be a little bit better. Uh, I could be on the road with them next weekend. We'll see. They actually are, are though this is not... The one part of it is official. They are not going to be able to play in Omaha. They're trying to figure out where to play, uh, if they can at all, for those series. Uh, but Boaz told us uh, on the radio show earlier in the week that they wouldn't be able to play those games in Omaha due to the weather. Uh, we'll see if they're able to make it somewhere. Um, you have to mention just coverage. Uh, mm -hmm. My brother and I host a Big Ten baseball-centric podcast called Big Baseball Podcast. You can find us at Big Baseball Pod on the Twitter. It's got great reaction so far. We're trying to cover. We talked to Illinois coach Dan Hartlett this week. Talked to Chris Webb, who covers uh, the Big Ten for 10innings.com and our first podcast, and we've gotten some really good feedback. We noticed that there wasn't anybody out there who was uh, covering the, void. the Big Ten in a, in a podcast form for baseball, and so uh, the reaction's been pretty good through the first couple of weeks. We've been pretty excited about it. I have to know real quick, lastly, um, who's supposed to win the Big Ten this year? And where's Purdue been typically picked to win or to finish in 2019 here? Well, they were picked sixth in a tie for six with Nebraska this year, uh, which is not bad. I think it's probably about where they should be. Uh, you know, Waz will tell you that they should be number one, but they're not there yet. Uh, the power programs, you know, traditionally in the big term, you know, Minnesota, who yeah. was great last year, picked to win this year. Michigan is ranked, I think, 17th or so. In this week's poll, they're undefeated. Uh, Illinois jumped into the top 25. They're traditionally a pretty good program. Uh, three years ago, 2015, so four years ago, won 50 games, made it to a super regional. Um, Ohio State traditionally is pretty good. You know, Darren Arstad coaches Nebraska. Yep. They probably uh, need to take a step forward this year. Had some injury problems last year. Um, but until Purdue found itself in some difficulty, it, it was one of the more consistent programs in the Big Ten there for a while, had, had some difficult years, but is getting back to it a little bit. So um, it's a, it's, it is a, a, a much better league now than it was 10 years ago. I mean, 10 years ago, it was a one-bid NCAA tournament league, and now you can expect to get three to five in there. Coaching has improved. Facilities have improved. It's just it's, unbelievable. It's just cold. <laughs> Yeah, symptomatic of the Midwest yeah. in, in February. Again, I was in, the, I was in Purdue in the mid-'80s, and baseball was just an afterthought. Of yeah. course, that, the field was right there off stadium by the track facility. And to see what that program has become, it's unbelievable. Um, the, again, that, the, the Dave Alexander Stadium mm -hmm. uh, and the success on the field, um, the program actually has some traction, and there's actual genuine excitement about when the weather's baseball. When the weather's nice? You'll get 2,500 out there at Alexander Field to watch them play baseball. It's just unfortunate that, you know, by the time the weather turns nice, there's only a few games left yeah. of the season. I mean, just because of the NCAA baseball schedule. It's, it's too bad they can't push – even pushing it back two weeks. And, you know, I, I can advocate for this all I want. Nobody's certainly listening to me. Uh, but if they could push that start date back to, 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 to today rather than whatever it is, February 16th or whatever – 
That would be that would tremendously go. better for all these northern teams, but they're not going to do it. No doubt there's about two, it. There's so many factors. We could get in this forever. <laughs> And I, this I know, is the podcast. I know we'll yeah, yeah. I mean, there's too many factors because there's summer baseball. There's the yeah. there's the draft in June. You know, in June, there there is all that stuff that is just ingrained in the sport. And to even move back NCAA baseball two weeks creates just a whole domino of issues that would have to be solved. Well, all right, we're going to take a break. Segment one in the books. We thank the great Kyle Charters for <laughs> dropping some Purdue gridiron knowledge in baseball knowledge on us and we come back we'll have the incomparable Brian Newbert right shotgun and he'll fill us in on all things golden black hoops thanks Kyle thank you sir